In this presentation, we are going to give insights and commentary on Mark chapter 5, some of the events that happened there, and then Matthew chapter 10. As with all of these, I would encourage you to read those chapters before watching the rest of the video or listening to the, if you're listening in audio format, so that you're familiar with the storyline and some of the things we will be talking about. So the first thing we'll take a look at is Mark chapter 5. And the first story we come across is a man who's possessed with a legion of devils. As Christ comes across this young man who has been afflicted. Let's just take a look at some of the major aspects of this story. So first of all, Mark chapter 5 verses 2 through 3, it says he lived in the tombs. So amongst those who were dead. In Mark chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, and Luke 8, 29, it says he was bound with chains and fetters, but he, would, but he broke them. And then in Mark 5, verse 4, he could not be tamed. He was always in torment. Mark 5, 5, he was night and day in the tombs, crying and cutting himself. In Luke chapter 8, verse 27, Luke tells us about this young man. He wore no clothes. And then in Luke 8, 29, he tells us he was driven of the devil. So it sounds like the devil had control over him and his movements and what he did. And then in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, it says he was exceedingly fierce. And then in Mark chapter 5, verse 15, Mark tells us, After the devils were cast out of him, he is clothed, and then he is in his right mind. I go over those because I want to suggest to you that we take a look at it, this story in this light. This story is a type. It is us without Christ. This is what we would be like if there was no Savior and there was no atonement. We would turn into this awful monster, so to speak. That <clears throat> title or label is going to be important here with something I'll read in the Book of Mormon. But without Christ and the atonement, we would be possessed of the devil. We would be without clothes, without being clothed by the atonement of the Savior. Uh, we would be tormented night and day, crying cutting ourselves, causing harm to ourselves. So this is a type of what our lives would be like without the Savior. Uh, we would not be in our right minds, and we would be amongst the dead. We could never live again. And so we find in 2 Nephi chapter 9, verses 7 through 9, listen to how Nephi describes what would happen to us if there was no, if it was not for Christ and his atonement, if there was never atonement, look how Nephi describes it and think of this young man. See if this is not describing this young man. Verse 7, Wherefore, it must needs be an infinite atonement. Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgment which came upon man must needs have remained to an endless duration. And if so, this flesh must have laid down to rot and crumble to its mother earth to rise no more. See, we would remain in the tomb, would be in the tombs. Verse 8. O oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy and grace. For behold, if the flesh should rise no more, our spirits must become subject to that angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God and become the devil to rise no more. See, we would become subject to him. He would guide and direct us just like he did this young man. Verse 9, and our spirits must have become like unto him, that is the devil, and we become devils, angels to a devil, to be shut out from the presence of our God and to remain with the father of lies in like misery, in misery like unto himself. 
yea, to that being who beguiled our first parents, who transformed himself nigh into an angel of light, and stirreth up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder and all manner of secret works of darkness. So that description by Nephi describes that this young man, they kind of go together, and we get an idea of how horrible our lives would be without Christ and the atonement. And then in this same chapter, in 2 Nephi chapter 9, we learn what will happen because of Christ and his atonement. Remember, after the young man had the devils cast out of him, and they said they were legion because there were many, that he was in his right mind and he was clothed. Now remember that as I read these verses now, 2 Nephi 9, verses 10 through 19 what we are like because of Christ and his atonement, or what we can become like. Verse 10, O oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. Verse 11, and because of the way of deliverance of our God, the Holy One of Israel, this death of which I have spoken, which is the temporal, shall deliver up its dead, which death is the grave. Verse 12, And this death of which I have spoken, which is the spiritual death, shall deliver up its dead, which spiritual death is hell. Wherefore death and hell must deliver up their dead, and hell must deliver up its captive spirits, and the grave must deliver up its captive bodies, and the bodies and the spirits of men will be restored one to the other, and it is by the power of the resurrection of the Holy One of Israel, just like the man who is restored to his right mind and his spirit restored to his body." Verse 13 in 2 Nephi 9. Oh, how great the plan of our God! For on the other hand, the paradise of God must deliver up the spirits of the righteous, and the grave deliver up the body of the righteous, and the spirit of the body is restored to itself again. And all men become incorruptible and immortal, and they are living souls, having a perfect knowledge like unto us in the flesh, save it be that our knowledge shall be perfect. Verse 14, Wherefore, we shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt, and our unclean clean, cleanness, and our nakedness. And the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment. And now listen to this. And their righteousness, and their righteousness, being clothed with purity, yea, even with the robe of righteousness. Just like the young man, when he had the devils cast out of him and became clean. He was clothed. Verse 15, And it shall come to pass that when all men shall have passed from this first death unto life, inasmuch as they have become immortal, they must appear before the judgment seat of the Holy One of Israel. And then cometh the judgment, and then must they be judged according to the holy judgment of God. Verse 16, And assuredly as the Lord liveth, for the Lord God hath spoken it, and it is his eternal word, which cannot pass away, that they who are righteous shall be righteous still, and they who are filthy shall be filthy still. Wherefore, they who are filthy are the devil and his angels, and they shall go away into an everlasting fire prepared for them, and their torment is as a lake of fire and brimstone, whose flame ascendeth up for ever and ever, and hath no end. If Christ had never come, that young man would have stayed in that wretched condition, that he was in. Verse 17 in 2 Nephi 9, O oh, the greatness and the justice of our God, for he executeth all his words, and they have gone forth out of his mouth, and his law must be fulfilled. Verse 18, But behold, the righteous, the saints of the Holy One, they who have believed in the Holy One of Israel, they who have endured the crosses of the world, and despised the shame of it, they shall inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and their joy shall be full forever. And then verse 19, O oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God, the Holy One of Israel, for he delivereth his saints from that awful monster, the devil, and death and hell, and that lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. 
what a blessing the atonement is. Look what Christ has done for us. If we so choose and use our agency wisely, we will escape that awful monster. Now, part of it is automatic. The resurrection will help us escape the awful monster of physical death and getting out of the grave for eternity. Now, whether I want to spiritually escape the spiritual death that can come from not following Christ, then that is up to me to use my agency wisely and follow Christ, and then I can be delivered up from death and hell, both from physical death and spiritual death, and rise with Christ because of his great mercy. What a great little story of what we would be like if we didn't have Christ's atonement and what we can become if we choose to follow Christ's atonement. Now in Mark chapter 5, verses 10 through 13, it talks about how the evil spirits wanted to go into the swine and Christ lets them enter into the swine. And then they go off the cliff and they die in the sea. Well, one, swine were a symbol of uncleanliness and unrighteousness. The final end then of those who remain filthy is death, spiritual death. So they entered into the swine, and this representing uncleanliness and righteousness. If I am resurrected in my uncleanliness and unrighteousness, then I must die spiritually and be kept out of the presence of the Father and the Son. To avoid, to avoid that, use the atonement to repent and become clean and clothed, become clothed in the robes of Christ's righteousness. Well, let's turn to Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, and then verses 35 through 42. This is the story of J Jairus' daughter who is raised from the dead. You remember, he sends for the Savior. His daughter is sick and is dying and has, has died, and Christ goes and raises her from the dead, what do we learn? Elder Howard W. Hunter of the Quorum of the Twelve writes the following concerning this story and what we can learn from it. We conclude this is, this is more than a simple story about a little girl who was sick, and Jesus went to lay his hands on her. Let me read these words to you again. And behold, the word behold is used frequently in scripture with a wide variety of meanings. It is used in this instance to designate suddenness or unexpectedness. Jesus and those who were with him had just recrossed the Sea of Galilee, and a multitude of people had been waiting, meeting him on the shore near Capernaum. And behold, suddenly, unexpectedly, there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, the larger synagogues of the day were presided over by a college of elders under the direction of a chief or a ruler. This was a man of rank and prestige, whom the Jews looked upon with great respect. Matthew doesn't give the name of this chief elder, but Mark identifies him by adding to his title the words Jairus by name. Nowhere else in scripture does this man or his name appear except on this occasion. Yet his memory lives in history because of a brief contact with Jesus. Many, many lives have become memorable that otherwise would have been lost in obscurity had it not been for the touch of the Master's hand that made a significant change of thought and action and a new and better life. And when he saw him, that is, when Jairus saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. This was an unusual circumstance for a man of rank and prestige, a ruler of the synagogue, to kneel at Jesus' feet, at the feet of the one considered to be an itinerant teacher with the gift of healing. Many others of learning and prestige saw Jesus also, but ignored him. Their minds were closed. Today is no different. Obstacles stand in the way of many to accept him. This was an unusual circumstance for a man of rank and prestige. Oh, I read that, sorry. I didn't mean to include that in the next slide. And Jairus besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. 
This is typical of what happens frequently when a man comes to Christ, not so much of his own need, but because of the desperate need of a loved one. The tremor we hear in Jairus' voice as he speaks of my little daughter stirs our souls with sympathy as we think of this man of high position in the synagogue on his knees before the Savior. Then comes a great acknowledgment of faith. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. These are not only the words of faith of a father torn with grief, but are also a reminder to us that whatever Jesus lays his hands upon lives. If Jesus lays his hand upon a marriage, it lives. If he is allowed to lay his hands on the family, it lives. Just interrupting these comments by Elder Howard W. Hunter, it would be a good thing to ponder then, how do I get Jesus to lay his hand upon me and my loved ones and my family? What does that mean? Back to Elder Hunter. The words, and Jesus went with him, follow. We would not suppose that this event had been within the plans for the day. The master had come back across the sea where the multitude was waiting on the shore for him to teach them. And behold, suddenly and unexpectedly, he was interrupted by the plea of a father. He could have ignored the request because many others were waiting. He could have said to Jairus that he would come to see his daughter tomorrow. But Jesus went with him. If we follow in the footsteps of the master, would we ever be too busy to ignore the needs of our fellow men? It is not necessary to read the remainder of the story. When they got to the home of the ruler of the synagogue, Jesus took the little girl by the hand and raised her from the dead. In like manner, he will lift and raise every man to a new and better life who will permit the Savior to take him by the hand. Aren't those beautiful words by Elder Hunter and how he has applied this story to us personally? One, do we allow Jesus to lay his hands upon us? Do we submit to his will so he can do that? And two, do we let him take us by the hand and raise us up? Do we put our faith and trust in him that we pray, Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just tell me, and I'll do it. And if we'll pray with that kind of faith, then he will raise us up. Let's go to Math, Mark chapter 5, verses 24 through 34, is the famous story that I believe is in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of the woman that had an issue of blood. And she was healed. We learn a great thing about the Savior and touching the hem of his robe. What were they reaching out to touch? May I suggest something to you and what it teaches? In Malachi, Malachi prophesied, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, that the son of righteousness, S-U-N, meaning S-O-N, the son of righteousness, the light of the world, would arise with healing in his wings. Now, in Hebrew, the word wings in Malachi chapter 4, in Hebrew is kanaf, meaning edge or extremity. So, for example, of a bird, its edge or extremity would be the end of its wing. So, that's why the word meaning edge or extremity can also mean wing. The wing of a robe, that should be robe and not rob, I apologize for that. Air, the wing of a robe would be its extremity or its edge, meaning the hem. And so Christ would rise with healing in the hem of his robes. And don't we see that in this exact story, the prophecy of Malachi fulfilled? In Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 40, the law of Moses commanded the Israelites to do this to the hem of of their garments, the edge or extremity of their robe. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make fringes in the borders, or the hems, of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a 
ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go a whoring, that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. And so on their clothing, of the hem of this particular part of their robe that they wore, that usually went to the waist, kind of like a waistcoat, they were put a ribbon of blue, and that was to remind them to keep the commandments of God and that they come from heaven. And then we read in Luke 8, 43, 44, the same instance of Mark chapter 5, the same story, and a woman having issue of blood twelve years, which spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, Christ, and touched the border or the hem of his garment. Immediately her issue of blood staunched, or it was healed, it stopped. Well, what was she reaching out to? May I suggest that they that when they were reaching for the hem, and they specifically, that's what they touched. You remember, they always mentioned them. They just didn't reach out and touch his clothing. It was the hem of his robe. And may I suggest that what they were reaching and grabbing was that blue thread. That was her way of grabbing and committing and her face saying, Jesus, I follow you. I will keep your commandments. Remember what Christ said? If you love me, then keep my commandments. If we keep his commandments, then we love him. And so she would reach out and commit and use her faith and said, I faithfully follow in your footsteps by keeping your commandments. And then what is the result? Then she was healed. Look at Mark 5, 34 of this same story in the version of Mark says, And he said unto her, Daughter, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Remember, he turned around and said, Who touched me? He, he felt virtue. He felt power coming out of him, literally. Who toucheth me? And Peter turns to him and says, We're in a crowd of people. And you, you mean, who touched you? What do you mean? And then he sees her. And she finally confesses it was I. And he said, Daughter, thy faith, because you willingly made that covenant with me to keep my, thy, my commandments you will always remember them and remember me. Thy faith have made thee whole. Now remember, she has already been healed of the blood issue. What does he mean, thy faith has now made thee whole? She is now complete. Her sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Be whole of thy plague. May I suggest it's not just the plague of issue of blood, but the plague of sin that afflicts all of us. That's what we want to be made whole from. And she was healed of both that day. What a great blessing. Notice in Enos, when he went out to pray and to get a witness of the truth of the gospel, remember he prayed all day and night, and Christ came to him and said unto him, Because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard or seen, and many years pass away before he shall manifest himself in the flesh. Wherefore, go to, thy faith hath made thee whole. See, Enoch didn't have anything physically wrong with him. He wasn't being healed of anything other than he was being healed of his sins. He was now, that was, that's what it means to be made whole, to be forgiven of thy sins. That's Enos chapter 1, verse 8, just like this woman. Well, let's now consider what is taught in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends forth the 12 apostles. He now commissions them to go on little mini missions and to go out and gives them power to heal the sick and afflicted, to use the power of the priest and the laying on of hands and to preach the gospel and sends them forth. And in this chapter, as he does that, he gives them some instructions and also tells them things that will happen. So we're going to take a look at what are those things that he tells them and those things that he instructs them on that we can learn from. First of all, Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes the following concerning this chapter. 
True ministers, those whose words and deeds have divine approval, are always endowed with power from on high. They always hold the holy priesthood, which is the power and authority of God, delegated to man on earth, to act in all things for the salvation of men. They never call themselves. They do not and cannot endow themselves with divine authority. They must be called of God. Even Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. That's Hebrews 5.5. 5. Even he was called and given power and sent forth by his Father. Those who are called of God thus become his servants, his agents, his ambassadors. They are sent forth to do what he wants done and to represent him. Their words are his words, their acts, his acts. When they serve within the field and scope of their authorization, it is as though the Lord himself has said or done whatever is involved. And so Jesus called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority, power and authority to preach the everlasting gospel, to proclaim the saving truths, to perform the ordinances of salvation, also that all men might be saved in his Father's kingdom. And in the very nature of things, it could not be otherwise. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. They had this power to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Because signs always follow faith. Miracles always attend the preaching of the gospel. No man since the world was, was has had faith without having something along with it. And so, if any believe their words and they taught the same gospel that he himself preached, there must be signs following. The sick must be healed, the dead must be raised, devils must be cast out, otherwise the power of God unto salvation, which is the gospel, would not be present. And so Jesus said unto them, Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. And so in this chapter, he gives them their commission, gives them some warnings, and gives them some instruction. And then they go out and later, remember, they come back and said, Oh Lord, even the devils obey us, even the sick arise. So let's take a look at some of the instructions he gave. First of all, we'll start with Matthew chapter 10, verse 6. They were sent to the lost sheep of Israel. There's an order to the preaching of the gospel, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. They are to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, preach the gospel of the kingdom, proclaim that salvation has come by me, that is Christ, command all Israel to repent and be baptized, exhort them to keep the commandments and perfect their lives. Say what we have heard Say what ye have heard me say. I am the light. Do that which you have seen me do. What does it mean to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand? It means the church of Jesus Christ is here. It has been organized and established. It is the kingdom of God on earth. Enter into it through the waters of baptism and ye shall be saved. In Matthew 10 verses 9 through 10. They are to rely upon the generosity of those whom they are sent to provide food, clothing, and shelter. This is where they're told not to go, to go without purse or script. Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. Not all of the house of Israel had equal claim upon the words of the Savior. Just as Israel is to hear the message before it goes to the Gentiles, so those in Israel who are worthy, who desire righteousness, who are living according to the best light and knowledge they have, these are favored above their fellows. The gospel is to be taught to them first. Jesus is not sending his disciples out to find harlots and whoremongers and thieves and robbers, although any of these may repent and be saved. But he has sent him out to find the honest in heart, the upright among men, those whose prior living has made them worthy to hear an apostolic voice. Such are the one in whose homes the twelve shall abide, and where they shall leave their blessing. Matthew chapter 10 verse 16. They were to be wise servants, giving no unneeded offense. In these verses, Jesus is not saying that wolves shall come among you or enter the flock and rend the sheep. No, he is saying, what he is saying is that without 
without, outside my church, are wolves, ravenous, murderous, hunger-maddening wolves. And I send the sheep of my flock out among them. See, they have to go out into the world where they're all of these deceptive and murderous people. The twelve were to leave the safety of the sheep coat and go out into the world where some would seek to rend and destroy them. Neither the saints nor the apostles court persecution or martyrdom. Rather, they do all they can in honor to avoid these Satan-spawned evils. Ordinarily, the work progresses more rapidly and ascends to greater heights when peace and fair-mindedness prevail than when all the vomit and bitterness of hell are gushing forth upon the helpless sheep. Neither the saints nor the apostles court persecution or martyrdom. Rather, they do all they can in honor to avoid these Satan-spawned evils. Ordinarily, the work progresses more rapidly as sends to greater heights when peace and fair-mindedness prevails, when all the vomit and bitterness of hell are gushing forth upon the helpless sheep. I apologize that I repeated uh, a couple of verses there. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, they were to beware. Persecution is an essential part of the creeds of all false religions. There is an eternal law, a law as eternal as heaven and earth and the universe, that truth will prevail. Left to itself, true religion, though it may be delayed or hindered in its progress, must and will prevail. The only effective weapon of false religions, and it yields only momentarily success, is to persecute true believers. So he warns them that persecution has come. They, they, they don't seek after it. They don't court it, like we said before. But it will come, and it will be there. So he warns them. Matthew 10, verses 19 through 20. They were to rely upon the gift of the Holy Ghost, revelation, to know what to say. No man of himself could possibly know what to say, either by the way of doctrine or of testimony, when held before earthly tribunals, or when standing in the congregations of the wicked, for no man knows the hearts of men. But God, who knows all things, promises by the power of his Spirit to put words into the mouth of his servants. As DNC 84-85 says, Neither take ye thought beforehand what ye shall say, is, is his word. But treasure up in your minds continually the words of life, and it shall be given you in the very hour that portion that shall be meted unto every man. Matthew 10, verse 21. They would witness the depravity and wickedness of moral degeneracy that is practiced in the name of religion. Lucifer would slay, if he could, every righteous person. None of the true saints would be left in mortality. And when depraved fanatics submit themselves to the will of the devil, they willingly deliver up unto death even their own family members. So that's what he's talking about in verse 21. Chapter 10, verse 22. Though the apostles would be hated by all men and opposed by the world, yet they were to endure in righteousness all the days to merit celestial salvation. They must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men, feasting upon the words of Christ, doing good and working righteousness, if they are to gain eternal life. And then as Doctrine and Covenants 98, 14 through 15 says, I will prove you in all things, the Lord says to his saints, whether ye will abide in my covenant, even unto death, that you may be found worthy. For if you will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy of me. And so that's why we have to go out to the world and we live in the world, but we try not to be of the world to see if we will abide in his covenant we are tested to see if we can prove worthy. Matthew 10, verse 23. They were to flee from persecution, not to court martyrdom, seek to live and spread the gospel. It is better to live for me than to die for me. There is work to be done. There are souls to be saved. You cannot carry forward my work on earth if you are dead. And then Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. As they persecuted the, the Savior, so too would they persecute the apostles. The disciple is not above his master, 
but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. I am perfect, suffer ye, and do as I suffer and do, and ye shall be perfect. And ye shall be even as I am, and I am even as the Father, and the Father and I are one. That's 35, 28, 10. Those who preach the gospel are to do so boldly, without timidity or trepidation, not fearing the face of man, but with courage of their convictions and in the fervor of their testimonies, using boldness, but not overbearance, as Alma said in Alma 38, 10 through 12. Truth learned in the day of preparation and schooling are to be broadcast from the housetops. That's from Elder McConkie's Doctrine of the New Testament Commentary. Matthew 10, verses 26 through 27, the counsel he gives. The apostles had learned the doctrine of salvation from Christ as they walked alone between the villages of Galilee. They had conversed together in the deserts and on the mountains. What the twelve had heard in darkness, they must now speak in the light. That which was hidden from the world is now to go to them. Go forth, proclaim my word in every ear. Matthew 10, verse 28. They are not to fear man who can kill, all, can, who can only kill the body, but fear God who can kill the body and the soul. That's who we should be afraid of. The worst mankind can do to us is to kill us physically. God can kill us physically and spiritually. That's whom we should fear and respect is God. Chapter 10, verses 34 through 36, the counsel he gives. The gospel divides men. Those who believe and obey in one direction, the unbelieving rebellious choose an opposite course. From among the unbelievers comes the persecutors, and the persecutors wield the sword against the saints. The gospel both saves and damns. It brings to peace the penitent and sorrow to sinners. And when the righteous and the wicked all mingle together in one social milieu, the preaching of the gospel spans anarchy and contention and warfare. The enemies of God and the opponents of true doctrine do not take kindly to the gospel of the kingdom, to the building up of the kingdom of God on earth. So that's what he's referring to in those verses. Chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 37. We come to earth to be tested and tried, to see if we will do all things that God commands. And if such necessitates a choice between father and mother, or son and daughter, and the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ, then so be it. There will be divisions within families. Some will have to make the sacrifice as they convert to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, accept Christ and his true gospel. Some will be shunned by their families, and they will be divided. We will be tried and tested many that way to see if they will follow. One such story was President Hinckley told in General Conference about a Pakistani naval officer he said there was a naval officer from Pakistan who was sent to the United States to receive training on a program that they had. And it just so happened that the state he was sent to was Utah, where he was to receive military training. While here, he hears about the gospel from the missionaries. He accepts the truth and joins the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it so happens that President Hinckley is able to meet this young man who is now converted as a Muslim from a Muslim religion to the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And President Hinckley says, now when you go back home, you are most likely to be stripped of your rank in the military. You will probably be shunned by your family for the choice of joining the church this decision has grave consequences. You will probably, like he said, be demoted. And your family will probably leave you. He said, he turned to this young man and said, Are you really willing to make such a sacrifice as that? And the young man looked at President Hinckley. And all he said was, Well, it's true, isn't it? 
yes, it's true. And then he said, what else matters? It is true, brothers and sisters, and nothing other than that matters. And finally, Matthew 10, 40 through 41, receive a prophet for what he is and gain a prophet's reward. What is the reward received by prophets? That it is eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God, none will doubt. Thus, by accepting a true prophet, men gain eternal life. Full acceptance presupposes obedience to whatever prophetic counsel and direction is forthcoming. The same reason applies to receiving a righteous man and gaining a righteous man's reward, which reward is exaltation in the highest heaven of the celestial world. And even those who perform but the slightest servant for the Lord's anointed or for the little ones of his earthly kingdom, doing so because those served are the chosen of Jehovah, shall be rewarded for their goodness. And so, brothers and sisters, may we all be proven true to keep our covenants and follow him, regardless of the cost and sacrifice that is required of it. Because it's true, isn't it? Therefore, nothing else matters. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.